Okay, hi, my name is Anthony Turner. I am one of the directors of the Small Business Institute, and today my guest is a gentleman by the name of Daniel Duckworth, who's an entrepreneur and an online marketing consultant. In fact, we're actually using Daniel to assist us with the uh, Small Business Institute on some of our strategic online work. Um, Daniel's been building websites, designing and executing online marketing campaigns, and uh, has launched a, a technology startup since uh, 2007, when you first started playing in the space, I, I guess. Daniel, just um, as you know, to, as a sort of an introduction to our, um, our viewers and our listeners, um, what's sort of some of the biggest mistakes that people make when they think about going online? Mm. I think the number one mistake that people make is they have this belief that if you build it, they will come. Okay. And it's just not true. So if you build uh, something online, whether that's a, a website or a Facebook page, and you just let it out there and assume that people will come to it, then you might get disappointed. Uh, and so I think it's about having uh, proper expectations about what you're going to get from what you put in. Okay. I guess that then raises the question in my mind, are websites right for everybody? Mm, yeah, and it's a good question. So there's sort of at one end of the spectrum, there's the very simplistic kind of website mm -hmm. that maybe, say, a, a local services person might have. It could be <laughs> a, a local carpenter or plumber. Yes. And, and a lot of people might say, well, what's the point? Like, it'll never really get found. They're going to have to spend too much money to actually get any benefit from it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's right up the other end of the spectrum where there's like these corporate websites that have a ton of information that no one actually wants. Uh, and so I think if you have the right goals and the right uh, way of using that website online, then there'll be a benefit to it. So we'll take the kind of the small um, end of the spectrum first. Um, they refer to it as something called hyper-local marketing. So if, if a website is uh, sort of created with the right goals, so it talks about the service and it talks about where that service is being performed, then it's quite likely that search engines will pick that up and show those results to the right people at the right time. Yes. Uh, and that's a pretty inexpensive thing to do. Uh, then there's the kind of, as you start moving up in the spectrum, there's more sort of consulting type services and it gets more, a bit more complex there because there's tons of consultants and how do you differentiate yourself and it usually comes down to demonstrating expertise. Uh, and so in that sense, it now requires a lot more input. Right. Uh, and so if, if you have the right expectation about how much input you should be putting in to get something out of it, right. then you'll be okay with it. But like I said, if you believe that you just build it and they will come, then it could be a disappointing process. Uh, so it just kind of depends what your business is, what you're trying to get out of it. Uh, and what your expectations are. But ultimately, there is a place for pretty much any kind of business to have a website. And I use the term website quite broadly. So even if it's just a Facebook page, technically that's kind of like having a website, but it's a, in a different ecosystem. So it's, <coughs> so it's what I would call having a web presence as distinct from having a website. Exactly right, yeah. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm thinking websites at the moment um, and why, if I'm a business, why should I invest in a website as distinct from, say, a web presence? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, <coughs> so uh, a, a lot of small local businesses might just go for web presence, like, say, a mm -hmm. Facebook page or a, a business listing on Google. Uh, but the moment they start to transition to a website, they're actually creating essentially intellectual property, something that's worth money. Okay. So the more time they spend creating content on that site, say that's a blog, yes. uh, and adding material to it over time, they're adding to their own creation rather than someone else's system. Right. So as you add material to, say, Facebook, what you're actually doing is reinforcing Facebook. And the more you do that, the less you're doing it for yourself. Mm -hmm. So depending on the kind of business, you might want to start saying, well, the time and money I spend creating material maybe that should be going towards us and our business and our website. Okay. You, you were talking earlier, Daniel, about optimization you know, and being found. Mm -hmm. you know, 
obviously, if you're going to have a website, this is going to be pretty key to be found. Mm. You know, um, how how can you understand you know that you are getting found, or how can you make yourself easy more easily found? Mm. Yeah, so um, I'll start with how can you get more easily mm -hmm. found. And SEO is actually really quite simplistic. Um, I think that it's been overcomplicated for a long time and there's misinformation and it's used to kind of sell something that's kind of complicated. But that's, that's actually not. It's, it really just comes down to having a website that has the right information for your audience mm -hmm. and is promoted essentially on other websites. So for every link that points to your website, it's kind of like a vote. It's like the internet is voting. Mm -hmm. And depending on the authority of the website linking to you is like a really good strong vote. So if your website has the right information and has a few links pointing to it from relevant websites, well, Google and Bing will send you more traffic. Okay. Does it cost much? Uh, essentially, no. Uh, but it depends on the scale of what you're trying to do. Okay. So for a small business website, you literally have you know, five pages, mm -hmm. something to describe your services, your team, and so mm -hmm. on. And you might have a blog that you talk about some, some of the stories yep. that you've been doing. Um, but if you're working on a kind of a bigger business, like maybe it's a community website, yes. then it takes a lot more involvement uh, and a lot more consideration that there's kind of technical aspects of SEO that come into play. But for the majority of businesses, SEO should be quite simplistic. It should just be about creating material for your potential customers and trying to promote that online. Yeah. You were talking before about you know, businesses having, um, you know, different types of businesses having different needs. So, you know, products there to sell products, uh, uh, consulting businesses there to sell expertise. Mm. Are there some specific ways in which businesses should actually be using their websites to clearly yeah. get yep. that across? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, I think if you're in a service type industry, what people are looking for is demonstration of expertise. Yes. And I think the sort of the quickest and easiest way to do that is actually to run a blog. So, I mean, for the last couple of years, there's been this term called content marketing. It's mm -hmm. kind of like a bit of a buzzword, but there's a lot to it. So if you do run a blog and you kind of hit on the right notes and talk about the right things and someone comes along to that and reads that and they say, oh yeah, these guys kind of do know what they're talking about. Okay. Um, the, the, the difficulty with this is it actually takes quite a long time. So when someone's in a kind of research phase, they might not be ready to buy today. Yes. So you need to have your material go out to them over a, you know, a period of a few months. And then when they're ready to buy, well, you're gonna be the person they come to. Um, so, service type businesses should be demonstrating expertise in this kind of content marketing. Mm -hmm. Product type businesses should be kind of telling stories about their products and stories about the people using their products. So what tends to work really well is finding people that actually love your products, talking to them, yes. uh, getting them to send in photos, whether that's on your website or like Instagram or whatever it is, uh, and engaging them. and kind of showing them to the rest of the community, hey, these okay. people like our stuff. Yep. What about sort of, you know, you mentioned community websites. Is there a difference for them? Uh, in terms of how they would use that? To, yeah, to so for community websites, there's this kind of technology component involved and it gets a bit more complex. So it's less about just the content that's been um, sent to the person and kind of yep. the readership. And then there's this sort of well, how are they creating information? Um, so for example, some websites uh, kind of create, say, forums or question and answer type forums. Yes. And this requires kind of a lot more thought and how does this work when someone asks a question and who gets notified by email and mm -hmm. suddenly it's, um, it's, it's, there's a community, this like thriving thing that's going on and it's out of your control. Okay. And this is often called user generated content. Uh, and when that begins to happen, well, it kind of takes its own form, and so you kind of become facilitators rather than the content creators. Okay, understand. Um, a lot of our people out there, you know, um, the other side of the camera, uh, are probably web designers. Mm. Um, and no offense to those guys, because I don't know them, you know, whoever they are. Um, but 
I would imagine because there are so many people who are portraying themselves as web designers, um, are there some, based on your experience, some really tip, you know, essential tips that you need to be thinking about when you choose a, a web designer? Yeah, um, so I sort of, I actually like to think about it as a kind of Venn diagram. So you've got your three circles, and the three circles are uh, sort of creativity and design. Mm -hmm. So something, they can build something that looks really nice. Yes. Uh, then there's a kind of technical side. So it needs to work really well. Yes. So it needs to kind of, you know, it should load really quickly and they should have some basic understanding of SEO and the kind of technical things. And then the third component is they should have a basic understanding of web marketing. So they don't just build it and leave you with it and you just hope you get some traffic. Yeah. They should have a kind of understanding and a bit of a plan and kind of guide you through that. Yeah. Look, as somebody who's um, arranged or organised and bought websites, you know, different ones at different times, that's probably one of the most crucial elements in, mm. in my mind. Um, I'm looking for my website to do something, um, not for it just to be made to technical specifications or to look pretty. Right, right, exactly. Um, and I think given how easy it is for people to learn web design, say just the technical component or the creative component, um, and the people who are buying websites might not know the importance mm -hmm. of the online marketing component, there's a lot of people out there just kind of selling this as a service. And I mean, that's okay, as long as the expectations of the client aren't brought really high, and then the person kind of under delivers and just delivers the website on its own and nothing else. Sure. So I guess for those people who are the web designers who are actually out there maybe watching this video, it's really important for them to remember that you know they are actually building a marketing machine, yeah, not a, uh, a, a something in cyberspace. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 a, it's sort of part of a larger, I guess, marketing funnel. Yeah. A couple of things that you were talking about earlier, Daniel. You were talking about uh, you know obviously getting found uh, and traffic. You know. Um, it's like you know, a shop, I would imagine. You know, the, the more it's open, the longer it's open, the mm. better better it looks. The more people are likely to come through the door. Mm. Um, and uh, what are there? A lot of ways seem to be fairly, could seem fairly costly. In um, are there sort of you know some really cost effective ways of how uh, somebody might build uh, traffic for their sites? Yeah, um, and so it's I mean it's kind of similar to what I've been touching on, and it's this thing kind of content marketing. Okay, so. If you, it doesn't create, it doesn't require a whole lot of expertise. Mm -hmm. You, people typically know their industry reasonably well. Right. And even if they only know it just a little bit better than somebody else, well then they've got something worth saying. They've got something worth telling. And there's, there's some statistics that actually say that, particularly in the business to business market, where businesses that blog will be 67 percent will generate 67% more leads per month. And that's just by doing something that's essentially free. Okay. So all they have to do is write some material that suits their audience and you'll get more traffic and more leads out of it. Mm -hmm. So essentially it is the most cost effective way to generate leads and traffic and interest in your website. Okay. And does that content have to be on the website or does that from other sources as well lead into the website? Yeah, ideally it's a mix of both. Yes. Um, so you, you sort of, you want to think of it as a bit like Rome. You know, you know all, all roads lead to Rome. Yes. You, your website is your Rome. This is, you know, kind of where the most important things are. But then you want to find these little kind of cities that you invest in mm -hmm. and that you contribute to over time yes. that directs people back to your Rome. Okay, cool. So there's, some people are not necessarily going to be confident about creating content. Mm. Um, are there processes or places they can go, you know, to actually help in that process? Yeah. So I mean, there's you know, there's sort of freelance copywriters, mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of it's co it's a common practice, and it's often referred to as ghostwriting. Right. And it's I, I wouldn't recommend it as a kind of long term strategy. It's mm -hmm. something that you would use to get started early, but it it kind of from what I've seen, the people who best know what to write about are the people in the business itself. Okay. So it's very difficult to get an external person to come in and see, okay, well, I'll, I'll try to be an expert like you guys and write this material sure. or create this video or whatever it is. You actually kind of need the people in that company or in that business to 
be producing that material and putting out to their audience. Okay. And are, are there places where you can actually go and get content uh, to use, or is that not a good idea? It's generally not a good idea. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it could be tempting to say, oh, here's a great article, I'll just give them credit and reproduce it on my website. Yes. Um, so that's, in terms of SEO, that's called duplicate content, and yes. search engines kind of know where content has come from. Yes. So you, you could put 100,000 articles on your website from all over the web, yes. and it would pretty much make no difference. Okay. Uh, the search engines know that it's somebody else's, and so it's not really going to benefit you. Okay. Um, you talked about blogging before. Uh, you know, how, how can that be sort of used more effectively, not just as a communication tool, but as a sales tool. Mm, yeah, okay. So, um, so I've sort of talked about this like demonstrating expertise and I think when people first come to blogging, they, they kind of create this material and then nothing happens. Yep. And they're like, oh, well, maybe this doesn't work. Um, and I think, I mean, the trend at the moment, and this, I mean, this might change at some point, is to kind of marry it up with some sort of more premium level content. So... What do you mean by that? It's, it's usually it comes in the form of something that you would download. Okay. Uh, and so that might be a checklist or it might be an ebook or it might okay. be something that's complementary to the material that you're blogging about. Right. Uh, and they call it an opt-in. So okay. you would exchange an email address to get this extra bit of content, yes. which now means you have a subscriber that you can talk to on a regular basis. Okay. So as a lead generation tool, that can be really effective. All right, fabulous. Um, what other ways are there to maybe to drive you know, traffic to your websites? Mm. Um, so content marketing being the mm -hmm. sort of most yep. cost effective. And blogging being one of the major tools of that. Yep. Um, then there's this sort of advertising networks that yep. are around. Um, so, I mean, most people have kind of heard of Google AdWords and mm -hmm. For the most part, that's the ads that sit alongside search results. Uh, then there's the kind of display network, so that's mm -hmm. the kind of banner ads you typically see on websites. Um, then there's uh, Facebook. Mm -hmm. So Facebook has its now its own sort of self-managed advertising platform. Yes. Um, and so the difference really between, say, uh, Facebook ads and Google ads is Google is very much sort of keyword focused. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's it's a little bit easier in that when someone types a particular word, they call it a commercial intent word. That is, someone right. is pretty much ready to buy. Yes. People n can predict what that is, and they bid a little bit of money to say, well, I want my ad to show when someone types this in, and I'll pay X number of dollars to have that visitor come to my site okay. yes. so that they might buy or subscribe. The difference with Facebook is that it's actually much more about demographics, and it's not about keywords. And it's a very different space. So when people are on Facebook, they're they're kind of hanging out. Like they're not looking for products or services in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so you, your ads need to have a different tack. They need to be kind of entertaining. They need to tap into this social world. Okay. Uh, and the way you target people is completely different as well because mm -hmm. it's based on demographics and interests. So it it would be a very good idea to create these things called buyer personas, like get a very good sense of who your potential customer is mm -hmm. and describe them in as many different ways as possible and mm -hmm. then break those down to as many categories as possible mm -hmm. and then start to figure out, well, what are, what are those interests and demographics and create those targeting rules on Facebook so that you're not kind of wasting time and money on too many people. Yeah. So with, the, with all this, we're talking content and you know, previously I said about you know, the sales, is there some sort of ratio of what is acceptable to you know, providing content versus you know, asking the sales question, buy something? Um, so I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean? So I'm thinking, I'm thinking in the blogging space, for example. Right, right, you know, right. It's, it's good to be putting out information, which is interesting and everybody mm. gets people engaged, mm. but you know, that can take a lot of my time. I really want people to buy stuff. Mm, you know? mm, mm. Is there some sort of ratio of you know, what is appropriate or inappropriate to actually say, hey, listen, buy something, or is there some way I can connect that blog to a, a buying decision? Yeah. Um, I mean, this is a very difficult question, and mm. it's something that people are still experimenting with. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no kind of golden ratio. It's going to be different for every industry. Um, 
But I think the safe thing to do is all your content should just be honest and yes. helpful and it should never be a kind of sneaky sales tool. It should just genuinely help the person. Right. And if you're going to advertise something, be very clear that it's separate to the content. Okay. Uh, so there's this kind of thing called advertorials, yes. or native ads as they're called now. And it's, it's when someone pays for the content to be created, but it's presented as if it was genuine. Okay. Um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It's a, it's a tricky thing to do. And I, I think that if you're just starting out, I think it's better to write great content and be very clear that your ad is separate to that content. And it's okay to advertise your products and services, yes. Yes. but you want to do it slowly over time and build trust with yes. those readers first. Okay. okay. So what advice would you have for people who are starting out with blogging for a business? Um, I, think, I think you just got to start. <laughs> it's, <laughs> and it's weird. I've written a bunch of posts for my business and helped other other businesses doing it. And there are things that we spent a lot of time planning thinking, this is it, this is going to be really good. And for whatever reason, it just didn't get a lot of traction and it didn't get a lot of shares and there was no real interest in it. Mm -hmm. And then there was other stuff that didn't take anywhere near as long, but just turned out really well. And people really liked that material and they downloaded that complimentary material and it generated a lot of leads. Um, so you just sort of have to start mm -hmm. and measure. So you, you, there's free tools like Google Analytics that mm -hmm. will give you reports on your yes. traffic. Um, but the sort of the basics of these uh, analytics tools is just giving you traffic numbers and they're kind of called uh, vanity measures, mm -hmm. vanity metrics. What you really want to know is, well, how many people actually downloaded this material? Yes. How many leads did this generate over, say, a six-month period? And that gives you a really good sense of whether that piece of material worked. Yep. Or you can use other metrics like the number of shares that it got. So if it did particularly well on a particular social network, it got, say, 500 shares or 1,000 shares, then that's a good sign that that's kind of working. So you take that, learn something from it, and adapt and keep yes. going with it. Okay, cool. Um, we're talking before about advertising and sort of you know the need to sort of keep that a bit separate from your content marketing so mm. that you're not really confusing things but um, obviously we do need to um, advertise because you know, that's what generates business mm. um, are there some sort of main online advertising networks that you know people can use for that purposes and, mm. and how do they work yeah yeah so really the main ones are uh, Google, Google yes. Ads, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and then there's a couple of other kind of smaller ones. So LinkedIn is great for business to business. Right. Uh, and it's really great for kind of targeting specific people at specific companies or even demographics of the kinds of people that work at certain kinds of companies. Right. Uh, Facebook is great for business to consumer. Yes. Uh, and Google AdWords is kind of great just generally because it's, you know, the moment someone's kind of ready to buy, you can put your ad in front of them, which is you know, really great timing. Um, but then there is this other side of like content marketing and advertising your content. Mm -hmm. And in some ways that can be a bit risky. So you kind of want to know that your content's working and performing well. You can, you can have it then distributed out to some large media channels yes. through uh, an advertising network. And one of the big ones at the moment is called Outbrain. So you can have your uh, content sort of promoted across any major news website and just mm -hmm. pay per click. Mm -hmm. uh, but you need to be sure that content is a strategy that you're investing in for a long time because you could pay a lot of money for traffic to come to this content and then not get any subscribers or not get many shares. So okay. it, that would be a kind of, once you're confident with content, then you might start advertising your content. But first I would be, uh, working with kind of direct sales type advertising. Right. So what about other things like, you know, we heard stories that, you know, Dell made a lot of money out of Twitter, for example, you know, are they, are they also tools that can work well for advertising? Yeah, again, Twitter is another great way to essentially disseminate content. Yes. Um, it, it's a bit tricky. Um, so I think it works well for big brands mm -hmm. and not quite as well for small businesses, right? Uh, but it can work for small businesses. So there's, it's a funny kind of network in that 
It's great for finding influencers. You can actually almost use it like LinkedIn. Yes. So y there are search tools that you can use. There's something called Follower Wonk. Mm -hmm. And you can use that to type in a, a bunch of kind of queries and say, these are the kind of people I'm interested in. Okay. And then you can target them and you can send messages to them and you can follow them and so on. So yeah. it, it's a pretty powerful tool. It's just a little bit unintuitive compared to the others. Sure. You, you mentioned you know, things like AdWords and Facebook and LinkedIn for advertising. Um, one of the metrics that I've heard is that you know, if you look at a Google search page, there's only about 30% of the actual people click on the AdWords. Is that, mm -hmm. Does that still hold true? And so if you're paying money for AdWords, how, how much likely are you to pay? But also, what's the real value to you? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, that's, that's kind of true as a very broad statistic. Um, but it kind of comes down to the types of search phrases. Yes. So um, you can kind of put it down into commercial intent searches mm -hmm. and kind of research type searches. Uh, so a research type search is actually going to cost you a lot less, but less people are going to be clicking on it because they're right. kind of not really interested in a sales message. Mm -hmm. uh, a commercial intent keyword might be something like buy dresses online. Yep. So that you know pretty sure that that person is ready to buy something. Right. And a higher proportion of those people will be clicking on ads. Um, so yes, it's true that maybe only 30% of the clicks go to the ads, yes. but it depends on the kinds of searches. So yes, it's absolutely worth it. But again, like with anything with internet marketing, you need to measure it. And you need to uh, measure the number of conversions and sales you're getting. Uh, and ultimately, what a, what a lot of people uh, kind of forget is to measure what your lifetime value customer is. Yes. So if you know what the average value of a customer is over say a three or four year period, well you know how much you can bid for every click mm -hmm. ultimately. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much how to kind of win at Google AdWords or any kind of advertising. Sure. So from what you're saying, I would imagine that the more popular the phrase is, the more like the higher it's going to cost you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Are there, is there any sort of ballpark about what you know costs it costs for an ad for mm, LinkedIn yeah. or Facebook or Google? Uh, so, so it depends on the industry. Um, uh, I think so. Say legal services. Mm -hmm. uh, keywords are going to cost you like fifty dollars a click. Like okay. a lot, yep. uh, whereas say an emerging service like an internet technology type service uh, might only cost you kind of ten cents a click. Okay. Uh, so it's going to be very dependent on the industry it, itself. Right. Uh, and it also kind of comes down to uh, how smart you are about the keywords you're mm -hmm. bidding on and how good your ads are and that kind of thing. So there's a lot to it and. I, I think it's it's great to hire consultants and great to kind of outsource to to companies, but it's also something that one should be learning. Okay. As we're coming into this kind of digital age, you know, if you compare, say, advertising from 50 years ago, people kind of got a sense of, well, I need to write a headline and it's got to be catchy and it's going to be this size and it's going to be printed here. Yes. And now things are different, and I think that we all should kind of learn a little bit about how ads work on the internet. Okay. Now, you're saying some cost there for Google. Uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, costing's about the same? Um, well, at the moment, Facebook is way cheaper than, say, Google. Mm -hmm. uh, and LinkedIn is kind of in the middle. Okay. Uh, so because Facebook is relatively new and people are still trying to figure out how it works, you're essentially paying, you're bidding on demographics so if you are targeting people who live in, say, a non-metropolitan area, mm -hmm. it's actually going to be really cheap to advertise. Uh, but if you're advertising to people in New York, then it's going to be really expensive because okay. lots of people are doing that. Okay. One of the terms, Daniel, that I've heard recently is a, a term called remarketing. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? Um, so remarketing is, uh, I'm kind of surprised that it didn't happen earlier. It's a very kind of simple way of having your ads shown to people that have already been to your website. Okay. Um, and it's actually quite powerful in that, say you're running an e-commerce website and you have mm -hmm. a particular category of products. 
Uh, if someone's visited any one of those products, you can now have a very custom ad that talks specifically about those products shown to that person across a, a range of websites. And that, that ad, they kind of call it like following the person around. Right. Uh, and there's these kind of stats that say, you know, it kind of takes 15 times for someone to see an ad before they're likely to buy. Yes. And essentially this gives you that way of showing your ad 15 times. You can have this ad okay. show on a bunch of different websites, very specific to what they're doing on your website. Uh, so it makes ads a lot more relevant and it kind of reduces the cost and increases the conversions and sales. When you're sort of playing in lots of spaces, um, I can imagine you've got lots of things happening in different spaces. Mm. How, how do you keep track of all of this stuff? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, each each ad network and you know blog software it all has its own reporting tools. Yes. Uh, and then there are these kind of aggregate tools that try to pull it all together. Um, and for the most part, it comes down to spreadsheets like. Okay. As long as you are recording particular time periods, you say, uh, you know what, I'm going to try writing uh, 10 blog posts over the next six months, and I'm going to buy some Google Ads. You know, just kind of record those as events, mm -hmm. what the time period was, how much yes. you spent on it, and have some kind of goals. Whatever those metrics are, you just have a kind of sense of, this is what I want to achieve, and you come back to it and say, well, did I achieve it? Right. And if not, what can we do better? Okay. Um, you mentioned you know, various analytics like Google Analytics is, is a classic one that's you know, freely available mm. across the mm. board. Are there others that you know, are as good as, better than? or? Yeah, so I mean Google Anal Analytics is probably the best at what it does, which is a kind of aggregate uh, data collection. Um, and at the very base level it's sort of you know, how many visits have you, are you getting, and if you configure it well, then you can uh, really dive quite deep into that data and learn a lot about your website. Um, so you could get a sense of, well, someone first came to my website through a Facebook ad. Okay. Then they came to it from a Google search because they found some content. Then they subscribed to an email mm -hmm. and they came back to the website and then they finally made a purchase. Okay. Uh, and so by knowing all of these things, you can now actually measure, well, how much did it cost me to acquire that as person as a customer? Yes. Uh, but that's done on an aggregate level for mm -hmm. Google. So there are other tools like, say, Kissmetrics, yes. which actually drills down to the kind of user level and it gives you uh, much more information about, well, what pages are they visiting and how long are they spending on those pages and what have they subscribed to. Mm -hmm. uh, and what that gives you the uh, facility to do is start sending targeted emails based on the things they're doing on your website. Um, so essentially what you're doing is creating more relevant messages to your email subscribers. Uh, one of the things that often happens is people will build up a, a big list of email subscribers mm -hmm. uh, and they'll send the same newsletter content to the entire list. And what tends to happen is some people joined up for a slightly different reason and the material isn't quite relevant, so you start getting unsubscribes. Right. Uh, and so what this kind of allows you to do is start to segment your users based on the actual behavior on, this, on your site, and you, you can start sending much more relevant emails to those groups of people based on the interest they've shown you. Okay. Speaking there just briefly about the tools that you might use to actually gather information, what about tools for disseminating information? Because you know, if you're in multiplying in a number of spaces, like you know, getting information from spaces, it can be very time consuming. Are there, are there mm. any sort of really good tools for the dissemination of information? You know what, there's actually not. <laughs> it's because everyone's internet marketing is different. They're doing something a little bit different. And I mean, the data is there, but it takes a person to sit down and look at it and think about it mm -hmm. in relation to everything you've been doing. And I mean, no real software could do that okay. for you. Um, but I mean, Google Analytics is pretty much where you would start. Right. Uh, but my kind of recommendation would be is to work with someone who really knows Google Analytics to configure it and set it up so that it's measuring more data than just traffic alone. Okay. What about, um, you know, we talked before, we touched on social media, you know, with Facebooks and LinkedIn's and Twitters and things like that. Are there, you know, one of the key things that I often hear from colleagues is that, you know, it takes so much time to market online 
Um, mm. There's so many different places that I can market online. Are there any sort of aggregate places where you can effectively, you know, do marketing, um, you know, on online, you, over across a number of tools, rather than sort of being reliant on having to go to each one of them individually in order to? Do yeah, that? yeah, there there are. Um, I think this is kind of a recent thing, um, and I mean I've experienced this with uh, some of my consulting clients where. They've worked with a provider that uses these aggregate systems that they can put ads out onto, onto multiple networks. Um, and what ends up happening is the data uh, is owned by that uh, aggregate company. Okay. And it means you get less transparency into what's happening and it makes it a little bit harder to measure and to report. Uh, so there's the kind of the convenience factor. Yes. Uh, but what you lose is you, you, you don't own that data anymore. It's not your Google Analytics account and it's actually sitting somewhere else. Yes. And so it's a little bit harder to get a sense of what's actually going on. Uh, so it's just a kind of... For you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. Daniel, in um, you know, wrapping up this conversation, are there one or two things that you would say that you know, if you're thinking about going online, these are the must-dos. Mm. And possibly one or two things which you would say these are the don't go there must mm. never do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the the must do is have goals and record those goals as kind of intentions yes. and just keep looking back every month or two and say well did we achieve it and if not what are we going to do next? Right. Um, and the other thing, I guess the thing not to do is to have uh, assumptions that don't quite match the way things work. So yes, it does take time. And yes, it does cost money. Uh, you know, maybe when the internet first started, there was a bit of a kind of gold rush where nice. whoever built websites got a ton of traffic because it was kind of fun. And all of a sudden, you know, this kind of dot, dot com boom happened. And that's just not really the way it works anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. So, y you need to have an attitude of, well, this is a business and this is marketing, this is advertising, and I need to put in time to get something out of it. And, and, and I'll pick up on that point, that last point there, that, you know, I think a lot of people think of websites as being not marketing, when mm -hmm. the reality is, you know, mark websites is all about marketing. It's yep. about communication with your customers, yep. you know, becoming the expert, as you said earlier, um, selling product or everything, or informing your your clients or potential clients, mm. but it's also a shop front to your business. And mm. uh, and I think, you know, I, I probably like you. I look at many different websites, and you know, I don't know that they're the most attractive mm. shop fronts mm. that you can have. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's a it's a representation of your brand. Yes. Uh, and I mean, even if the person isn't going to be buying something through your website, you know, and even if they're a referral, uh, they'll probably look you up on a search engine like Google and check out your website and just get a general sense of who you are and what you do. And unfortunately, we do kind of judge a book by its cover sometimes. And yes. if the website doesn't perform well, people tend to make a bit of a value judgment about the quality of the business. And whether that's the right thing to do or not is a different point, but it does happen. So yes. I think that it's important to keep websites kind of up to date and looking good and secure yes. uh, and, and that doesn't even have to be an expensive process. I yeah. mean just to have a basic kind of website there's DIY type builders that will cost you $20 a month and you can have really great looking websites Yes. Um, and of course as I was saying the caveat to that is it's not going to generate you tons of sales if you don't put in the marketing effort. Yes. Yeah. And I guess one of the other things is to remember, and I'm sure you'd agree, is that you know, if you're using multiple platforms to market your products, you've got to make sure that your brand is consistently yeah. represented across all of those platforms. Yeah. 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 That's a, yeah, that's a really big one. I mean, I've kind of experienced problems with that myself where different graphic designers have been working on different ads and mm -hmm. some of them include the branding in one way and some of them do it in another way or not at all. And so there's this kind of, well, you know, if you're spending money on advertising, you want you want your branding and logo to be consistent and shown over and over and over and over. Yeah, sure. All right, well, Daniel, thank you for spending some time with us today. Uh, my name's Anthony Turner from the Small Business Institute. We've been talking with Daniel Duckworth, who I said earlier is a, an online 
marketing consultant. Um, uh, since 2007, Daniel's been building websites, designing and executing online marketing campaigns and launched a technology startup. And also, as I said before, you know, we've engaged Daniel to help us with our online strategy. So Daniel, thanks for spending some time. Thank you.